here, and my hope here today is to try to inspire you. Inspire you to perhaps do things that aren't kind of on your horizon right now. Uh, and I want to kind of give a, you know, uh, kind of a broad-based look at what I call the arc of life. This, uh, there is a paper that is pretty much the same thing. The, the paper came first, and then I created the, the, uh, the deck. Uh, the paper is available on my LinkedIn site. You can find it if you want to read it. It's called The Arc of Life, so you can find it there. And uh, I think they're recording this, and I'm certainly happy to provide soft copies to anybody. Um, okay, so uh, we talk about the corporate life cycle. Uh, we all know the part that, you know, startup, uh, kind of high, high growth once you get traction in the marketplace, early maturation. Those are the nice parts of the, of the curve. Uh, late maturation, decline, and then death. And you know, decline and death. Decline is characterized by shutting factories, laying off people, uh, getting in trouble with your banks in terms of you know calling loans and things of that nature. Um, so the key variable on that picture, the bottom of that picture, the x-axis was time. And different companies uh, have different life cycles as a function of uh, market forces uh, and technological change, political climates and dynamics. Um, uh, economic spikes and dips and popular trends. Every company goes through this. Uh, you know, there are no companies that have been with us for 5,000 years. Um, interestingly enough, when I grew up and started my first job, I kind of thought every company was 5,000 years old and would be there 5,000 years in the future. I had this kind of strange, you know, kind of uh, uh, naive view of the world. Um, many companies tra traverse this arc of life. One of the kind of poster children to kind of get us to think about this is Kodak. Kodak is a truly, truly, truly great company. They created the film industry. They created the whole idea of chemicals, uh, you know, chem chemical photography. In fact, what was interesting about Kodak was that uh, they had virtually all of the patents on digital photography. Uh, they invented all of the digital cameras before anybody else did. They had all of the information. You all know that, that wherever you went in the world, uh, you know, you could find a little kiosk with little yellow boxes in it, you know, a little kind of Kodak picture shot, you know, picture locations and stuff like that. And then they failed. And they not only failed, when they went to sell their only remaining asset, which was their digital photography, patent portfolio, there were no takers for it. This is a tragic story of a once great company, a company that had one of the most amazing brands. Their brand in their day was like Apple's brand is today, and they died. Um, another company is BlackBerry. Uh, we all know what happened to them. They owned the market for corporate, uh, you know, smartphones. Everybody liked a little, you know, little keypad over there, and Apple came out and put them out of business, and they and they knew what was going on. They had all the data. They, they went and bought an iPhone and looked at it and everything like that. And they just couldn't get out of their own way. And they basically blew up. And I don't know what the company's worth today, but not so much. I, I don't mean to depress you right here. Um, now, I didn't have enough room on this page to put all the companies I could think of. But this is, you know, there are just companies after companies after companies where we can look at this life cycle of this company that's a once great company and then winds up dying. And the question is why and what can we do about it? So some transform. One of the interesting, really interesting companies in the world is Nokia. Uh, it began as a paper mill in Finland in 1871. In uh, 1927, some 50 years later, they transformed themselves into a rubber manufacturer. Pretty amazing change, you know. Not not much, to, you know, in common between those two. In 1960, uh, another 40 years later, 30 years later, they entered the telecom market uh, with telecom equipment, uh, switching equipment, and, and and they entered and came to dominate the mobile phone market in 1982. This is quite a story. I mean, paper mill to leader in the mobile phone market, you know, and. Uh, let's see, something like about 100 years. They were able to transform themselves multiple times to stay relevant to the world. Uh, they built its success on transformative leaves, and after a catastrophic loss in mobile phones, as, as with BlackBerry, they sold the division to Microsoft in 2014, and it's kind of disappeared at this point in time. 
So the question with their enduring culture, what is the, 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 the culture that, that is the character, that is the essence of Nokia? Can they, will they, can they transform and rise again? We don't know the answer to that. They're still around and, you know, they, they have it in their DNA to be able to do this and most companies don't. So life cycles are compressing. You know, uh, Nokia had 50 years to make their first transformation. They're compressing because of computers and robots and cloud and big data and deep learning. All these technolo technology things make the life cycles go faster. Business model innovation, Uber and Twitter. Uh, who 10 years ago would have thought there was going to be an Uber? And the transformation to the entire, you know, taxi and transportation industry is really quite amazing. Um, all those guys that were buying medallions in New York City, taxi medallions, they didn't transform, right? They, and the value of their medallions went from a million and a half dollars to like $200,000, you know. Now, couldn't have happened to a nicer bunch of guys, I have to say. Because those cabs, if you drive around in them, are really crap. Nobody ever fixes them, you know. They rent them out to these guys they take advantage of. So, as far as I'm concerned, couldn't have happened to a nicer bunch of guys. Only the paranoid and those who transform will survive. The paranoid meaning the people who look on all sides, look behind them, look at all the changes that are coming, and those who are willing to, to transform, and this takes courage. It takes courage to transform. In order to transform, you have to take risk, and risk is, risk is, is frightening. So um, I talk about the arc of life, and I talk about transformation as the opportunity to build essentially a new business another version of the old business on top of the one you have. So instead of going over to the, instead of going down on the, on the far side over there, you do a transformation. Uh, it turns out that there's actually a sweet spot of optionality. So if you look at the far end of the curve, the arc of life curve, that's not a sweet spot. When things are declining and the banks are calling their loans and you're laying off people and shutting down factories, you don't have the resources inside the company to actually do the transformation. You don't have the intellectual resources to apply because you're busy doing all this stuff. You probably don't have the capital resources to apply to do this. But when you're in the high growth phase and the wind is at your back and things are going good, that is the time to think about this is not going to last forever and what am I going to do next? That's the time to do it. Um, so I kind of look at the, the, the chart on optionality looking like this. There's really peaks right at the early stage over there and then it declines very, very rapidly. So successful transformations create a new growth trajectory. Uh, real simple, you do a transformation. Five years later you do another transformation and you, you basically take a company that's on a growth trajectory of this and you put it on a growth trajectory of that and we forget about the parts that are going to die. Who cares? Let's take a look at a case study. Um, I think these are these are actually fascinating how these companies have transformed themselves. Now, Oracle, personal opinion, I wouldn't want to work there. I don't kind of personally like the culture. But I have infinite admiration for the strategic thinking uh, and courage of, uh, of Larry Ellison. Um, so it was originally founded as software development laboratories in 1977. They searched for product market fit via customer consulting. They basically kind of did you know, you want a database, I'll build one for you, and you want another version of it, I'll build one, I'll build that one for you, and they kind of financed the company the way. This is a little side note, Oracle was built on about a million dollars. You know, you hear about all these crazy numbers in Silicon Valley these days. Um, they focused on industry-wide platform to make database compatible. What does that mean? So, uh, in the world, in the relational database wars, uh, you know, Sybase and Informix and RTI and whatever, they were all focused on building the best features and the fastest performance. And they kind of built a, you know, uh, less features, less performance, but they made it run in every single platform that was out there. And as a result of that, they were able to attract all of the value-added resellers, the guys like PeopleSoft and uh, Siebel and stuff, all built their stuff on stuff of Oracle because once they did that, they could then sell it on all the different platforms. So they had a strategy that was better than the other guys, which is why they basically won that war and everybody else is pretty much gone. They, their versatility distinguishes as a choice for application developers and, and resellers. Now, so that's how they got started. Uh, it was a great strategy. Uh, but, you know, they looked at the world of database and they said, it's a great business. Um, we've pretty much saturated the market. Things are pretty good. 
you know, what are we going to do for a second act? And what they did for a second act, which I consider to be one of the most courageous things I've seen in business, is they decided to build their own ERP client server applications. Now, why is this courageous? Because all of the pull in the market that they had at that point in time, from the PeopleSoft and the ERP vendors and everything else, they basically declared war on all those people. They basically said, I'm going to go compete with you directly for your business. And the risk was that they were going to go abandon this company. SAP was an interesting company at the time. SAP was running on Oracle. And SAP could have, at a stroke of a pen, acquired Sybase and said, I can play that game too. But they didn't do that. They basically they let, let themselves become victims. And as a result of that, Oracle was able to build a business that's today competitive with SAP and would, wouldn't have otherwise been able to do that. Um, in 2004, uh, Oracle did another thing that was interesting. They basically did the first ever hostile takeover of a company in Silicon Valley. Uh, kind of made everybody read the papers every day because it was like a little, you know, kind of a little mystery story. Uh, and they roll up all the enterprise application companies. Uh, and they basically kind of not only had their own ERP system, but now they had a complete suite of everything. And then finally in 2010, they did the acquisition of Sun Microsystems. They got in the hardware business, which they have been, I don't know how well they're going to do in it, but they certainly did that. And, you know, today the, 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 the quote from Larry is, if the internet turns out not to be the future of the computing, we're toast. But if it is, we're golden. And I'd say things are looking good for Oracle right now. So that's a story of transformation. Look at all those arcs. Look at, you know, if the company had not done those things, they stayed as a database company, which was a great business. It was a great business. They really owned the marketplace. It's a time to kind of sit back and kind of pat yourself on the back and feel really comfortable about things. But they did all these things instead. Um, a sidebar, everybody, I think you all know the story of Sun Microsystems, another great company in the valley. They went into the file server business. They became the dot and the dot com in the, in the, 20, in the, in the 2000 time frame. They basically uh, became the mainframe replacement. Uh, and then they failed to make the last transformation. I, I view the missed opportunity is they could have been the software supplier of operating systems to the world. There would be no Linux today if they said, okay, we're a software company, we're gonna go sell operating systems. They had the best operating system, they had a five year lead on everybody in the business. But they couldn't get out of their own way, like Kodak, of thinking of themselves as a company that sells iron and the software is just there to make it work. Couldn't, they couldn't get past that. Um, Another case study is Amazon. Uh, we all know and love them. Does anybody uh, order anything from Amazon? <laughs> <laughs> They're going to have this instant delivery. You're going to think about it and it's going to show up in front of you. It's going to materialize. Uh, so paper books was the first thing they did. Ebooks and readers. Um, all products. Uh, they built the merchant system. They, le they, they leveraged off the merchant system to build AWS. Um, do they have that in here? Uh, yeah, they 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 use their merchant. They built the merchant system as a cloud as a cloud service system for their merchants, and then they said, well, "Hey, why don't we just sell it to everybody?" And they kind of created this huge cloud business, and they are today the leader in that business. So, um, my own story, um, it's a story of transformation. Uh, I was on the board of directors uh, in the later years of Tolerant Systems. They actually tried to hire me to run the company, and I didn't want to do it. And in 1989, uh, we went from 200 to 12 employees because uh, the business failed. Um, we did a reverse stock split of 50 to 1. We converted everybody to common, did a pay to play 50 to 1 reverse stock split. It's kind of interesting, you know, times for the company. Uh, I told my, I then said to them I'd be interested in running this little software company. And I told my investors, you know, we have more people that come to a board meeting than we have employees. Your job is to clean that up, okay? So they did that. Uh, in 1993, we did a, we did a, a what I would call a, a, a nano IPO. We did an IPO where at the end of the IPO, when we raised $16 million, we were worth $64 million. That's a pretty tiny little IPO at the time. Um, we were in a business uh, that I characterize as very interesting. We were in a business, we were a $10 million business in, in 93, profitable, 
we had a great runway in front of us. We were selling operating system components to systems manufacturers, which then they incorporated into their operating system, like Sun and HP and companies like that, and then they resold it. And we had, we had licensed this technology to 60 of the 100 companies that were selling Unix at the time. It's pretty good. Kind of like Oracle in the good old days, right? They got everybody to sign up for their stuff. Um, we sat down and we thought about it and we said, well, look, these guys will pay us a million dollars a year, each of these guys. Each of these guys will pay us $3 million a year. They'll pay us $5 million a year if they're not looking, if they're not paying attention. They'll never pay us $25 million a year. So there's an upper limit because they can design you out or force you to cut your price with the threat of designing you out. So there's an upper limit on what you can do. And uh, then we said, what's going on in the industry? Well, we could see 100 companies, but we knew they, they were consolidating. And we knew that they were going to be 10. 10 times 5 is $50 million. So that was kind of the window that we said we could, that's how big we could become with the business if we did nothing except just kind of milk it, which is, you know, kind of an easy thing to do. Um, it turns out we were wrong. It only, there weren't 10 companies. It only ended up with like three or four, uh, which is even worse. So in 1994, we kind of paid attention to this. So we faced this reality. And we did a strategic plan that said, how do we change this company? How do we find a way to go beyond $100 million? In 1997, we entered the backup market. We were in the operating system components that, rent, that did file and disk management. So we had all the interior data, kind of like Microsoft and the browser business. And we entered the backup uh, market because if you own the inside of the operating system, you can have a better backup than anybody else. Uh, in 1999, we entered the NT backup market by acquiring Seagate Software. Both of these acquisitions were planned as a strategy in 1994. It took us three years to do one. It took us five years to do the other one. Uh, these were very, very difficult to do. Uh, these were not uh, roll-ups. These were strategic acquisitions because we couldn't do these things organically. There was no way we could get there. Um, in 2000, uh, in 1996, by the way, before we did this whole thing, we were $36 million. In 2000, uh, after we did these two transactions and incorporated this into this new model, we dominated the industry. We put our competitors out of business. We we're worth $1.2 billion. And in, two and in 2001, my last year in the, running the company, we hired a new CEO that year. We did $1.5 billion. So from 1996, we went from $36 million to, to in five years, to $1.5 billion. That's not market cap, that's revenue, just so you know. Uh, around Silicon Valley, everybody talks about market cap and how much they raise as a measure of, their, of the quality of the company. I always like to talk about revenue and profits and gross margin, because I think that's what matters. Um, uh, the new CEO, I actually had a strategy for the company at that time, uh, which was to acquire VMware and roll up all the Linux properties, but the new CEO said, I don't like your ideas because you're the old guy. I have my new guy. I have my own ideas. It turned out he didn't have any ideas, so sold the company to Symantec. So that's the, that's the Veritas story. It was acquired by Symantec in 2005. I was long gone. And then in 2016, Carlisle did an LBO and bought the company. And it's an independent company again. So I think that uh, this idea of transformation uh, is embedded in the leadership in the company. Uh, I'm, a, I'm a very, very strong believer uh, in, the, in, the, in the power of the CEO, not power in a, in a way of telling people what to do, but the power of the CEO to, to change the direction of the company. I, I always describe to people that uh, from a cultural point of view, you hire a new CEO in a company, everybody stops what they're doing and says, what's important now? How do I get ahead? How does my career work with this new person? Uh, there's a cultural transformation in one day. Uh, I believe that uh, CEOs um, have the power to change things that other people in the company simply can't do. Um, so I think there's two kinds of CEOs. There's what I call operationally driven, operational excellence, uh, efficiency, consistency. People tend to be risk adverse. They tend to be professional managers. You think about you know, some of these big companies, they have a transition from uh, a sitting CEO to a number two in the company. And that person basically views that um, 
he's going to be there between five and ten years because he doesn't get the job until he's 55. He's going to be there five to ten years. And all he wants to do is not make a mistake and make his quarters and go home. That's kind of like, you know, that's, that's kind of like what drives these people. Um, and then there's the opportunity driven. Uh, visionary driven creative strategies willing to take risks, entrepreneurial, and they're narcissistic. They want to build a legacy. They want to put their name on it. You know, this, this is a perfect description of Larry Ellison, right? Um, now, when I wrote this paper, I didn't have this at, the, at my fingertips, but this is a great example that we can look at today in the marketplace of the operational CEO uh, and, the, and the opportunity driven CEO. So if we think about Microsoft, Microsoft, uh, Steve Ballmer was a CEO there for about, I don't know, 10 years or so. And in 10 years, he did nothing. He kind of just made the company become more and more irrelevant in the eyes of the industry. And he milked the base, but he made the quarters. And then in, uh, I guess, a few years ago, four or five years ago now, they hired Satya Nadala to run the company. And he has transformed this company. And Microsoft is, once again, relevant. Uh, they've done things that were considered uh, uh, impossible to do under Bomber. You can get uh, Windows Office Suite on your phone for free. You can get uh, Outlook for free on your phone. Uh, this was never, this was, a, this was like, they could never think about this because this was the heart and soul of the company. I can't give it away. And yet the market had changed and they didn't change with it. The other example uh, is at Apple. Apple was uh, certainly an exciting company under uh, Steve Jobs. It uh, transformed. To ha I have some interesting theories about Steve Jobs and the, and the company. And now we have Tim Cook. And I described Tim Cook as the new Steve Ballmer. So in the last six years, basically we've gotten a new, a new, uh, a new uh, camera. And then this year, we got a new screen, you know, as of yesterday. I mean, that's not a lot of transformation. Now, he's going to milk this thing. He can milk this thing for 25 years because the, the base is so strong and it's so locked in and so captured and everything like that. So he's got an opportunity to milk this thing forever. But you look at Steve Jobs and, and, and Tim Cook, and you look at Steve Ballmer and Satya Nadella, and you get perfect, you know, kind of contrast of these two, of these two kinds of characters of people. It's a really interesting thing. I mean, I'm, I'm kind of a, a student of this stuff. So what can we do? Uh, you know, there's always the, the idea of, of, you know, the prescription, right? So if you're the board of directors, uh, which I illustrate here with the uh, minions, um, you can look for uh, if a CEO succession should consider future direction. Is it transformation or consolidation? A good example of this was uh, HP. Um, you know, they, uh, they decided that after a lot of internal promotions, they needed new blood in the company to transform the company. And that's when they, when they hired Carly Fear, and it didn't work out real well. But they did exactly this. They said, this company is in need of transformation. We need to go out and get new thinking and somebody with, you know, is willing to do things that we weren't willing to do before. Uh, if it's transformation, you probably hire from the outside and seek transformative characteristics. You probably take risk. Carly was a perfect example of that. Uh, you need to establish a long-term strategic plan for transformation. Uh, I'm a big fan of strategic planning. Now, strategic planning doesn't mean appointing a VP of strategic planning and asking them to build you a deck. Strategic planning means you taking responsibility, I mean, hopefully, with the smartest people in your company, uh, to sit down and to think through every possible path this company can take given its current resource, drive every single one of them to the ground, uh, and look for the opportunities, and they appear. There are things that you've never thought about when you do that. When you, can, when you identify 25, 35, 45 opportunities, you're going to look in there and you're going to say, oh, I never thought of that. That is really interesting. That's how we, got, that's how we did that at Veritas. Uh, that's, that's really interesting that we could do that. Um, Keep your cash. It's the fuel required for transformation. Uh, the world we live in right now, you know, we have these activist investors, and uh, you, you've heard of ISA. I don't know if I'm, how many of you have public companies, anybody? 
lucky you. <laughs> ISS, I call them, ISS is Institution of Shareholder Services. I call them ISIS because they're, you know, financial terrorists. Uh, all these factors out there are terrible. I, I mean, uh, you sit at a board of directors and management comes in and says, oh, you know, all the investors are unhappy. We haven't had enough appreciation in the stock. We have to go uh, do a dividend. We're going to go give them some cash. And I, and I always sit there and say, like, why do we want to give them the cash? The cash is, you know, if we have an idea, the cash is what we need to go ex execute that idea. And if you give them the cash, these, quote, investors, uh, there are no investors anymore, there's only traders. These investors have one finger on the sell button, you get a $2 pop in the stock, they hit the button and they're gone. So why do we want to take care of these people? So I'm a believer, keep your cash. Keep your cash. Don't get, you know, intimidated by the external world. Uh, when making bold moves, stay the course. Be, will, be willing to weather criticism from the street and live to fight another day. I should tell you, the first... Um, uh, acquisition we did, we acquired another public company of the same size in 1997. Uh, Our stock went down by 65%. And all the investors called my board of directors and said, fire that more and he's killing this great company. And we prevailed and we, you know, kind of got through it and, you know, we, 36 million and we acquired this company of 36 million and we kept about 20. We finished the year at 120 million. Stock price went back up. Everybody was happy. Two years later, we get to do another deal. Acquire a company the same size as us, 200 million in revenue. We're 200 million in revenue. We announced this thing after thinking about it forever. And I go back to Wall Street and I say, remember me? If you sold your stock, you lost. And if you, if you bought stock at that point, you made a killing. Our stock went down by 75%. So it takes, it takes real courage. It takes real, the pressure in these situations is unbelievable. Um, okay, so that's what the board can do. The executive team uh, establish a five-year quantum, quantum leap strategic plans. I, I think you engage as many of the smart people in your company as you can. Evangelize the vision throughout the company at every opportunity. Everybody in the company needs to know where you're going. When transformation happens, everyone will actually understand and be on board. Uh, encourage autonomous decision making and experimentation. Uh, make it high reward and low risk to do things in the company. Right now, it's the other way around. It's high risk and low reward to be uh, kind of a maverick in a company. And what you really want to do is you want to make, you want to reverse that and you want to encourage that kind of innovation. Create a culture around conquering the world. Create a culture that inspires people in the company uh, building a great company is, and the leadership of it is a lot to do with inspiring people. I, I, don't, I don't believe in telling people what to do. I believe in inspiring them to do great things. And you build a, in the culture of the company this thing, we're going to be a great company, we're going to do this together, and this is how we're going to do it. And you inspire people. Um, there's no finish line. Uh, I, I love this expression because we, in business, think of, you know, we go through this startup phase, this creation phase, and we kind of think there's this nirvana out there, right, where all the problems are behind us and everything is working and, you know, we're making money and it's profitable and we got good gross margins, you know, and the orders are coming in and everything is good. There's no finish line. The problem is that business will go away. And, you know, you, 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 you kind of have this feeling that you want a finish line. We kind of think of it as a finish line. But there is no finish line. There's just more. There's just, like, the next thing to do. Thank you very much. <laughs>